Welcome to Swift Education Center's Equity Forward Forums for Educators, an ongoing series in which we connect educators and others who invest in the lives of young people with authors, thinkers, scholars, organizers, artists, and visionaries that inspire us in our work to build equity and join justice. We hope that you're inspired too. My name is Wade Kelly. I'm the Assistant Director of Content Development at Swift Education Center. Let's get started. Scott Kursige is Executive Director of the American Studies Association and President of the James and Grace Lee Boggs Foundation. He studies race in a comparative, intersectional, and transnational framework with a focus on urbanism, white supremacist violence, social movements, and revolutionary praxis. Kurshige is the author or co-author of four books, The Shifting Grounds of Race, Black and Japanese Americans in the Making of Multi-Ethnic Los Angeles, The Next American Revolution, Sustainable Activism for the 21st Century with Grace Lee Boggs, Exiled to Motown, a history of Japanese Americans in Detroit with the Detroit JACL History Project Committee, and The 50-Year Rebellion, How the U.S. Political Crisis Began in Detroit. Dr. Kurushige, thank you so much for being here. You have the floor. Well, thank you, and I'm really honored to be here, um, and I'm just um, so appreciative of the work you're doing to address you know, the urgent need we really have um, for education um, in our society. And I'm gonna talk about a specific aspect of that um, work, which is why we urgently need Asian American studies. And when I talk about Asian American studies or when I talk about Asian Americans in general, I'm just not talking about specific people you know, defined by race or ethnicity. I'm really talking about how all of us are connected, right? And this is a big, uh, um, I think, value of the center that all of our experiences are connected and we really can't understand our own experiences unless we see that we're part of broader relationships um, and structures and histories. Um, so that's what I'm gonna into today. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, do a slideshow to accompany um, my presentation. Okay, so I'm gonna give a presentation um, that really covers just some of the um, basic aspects of Asian American studies um, and Asian American history, obviously a, a topic that, you know, when I'm teaching a class, I might take a whole semester. If I'm writing a book, it might be hundreds of pages. But this is hopefully an introduction to some concepts um, and some uh, events in history that will really help us to think about broader critical questions um, and discussions. So I want to begin today by talking about um, a really horrific story that most people probably saw in the news. Um, last year in 2021. Uh, and this was, of course, you know, during the pandemic and during this wave of violent attacks um, and hate crimes against Asian Americans. Um, and unfortunately, we oftentimes don't think about groups or don't talk about them in the public, or we don't give them attention, you know, um, in the policymaking arena until a tragedy strikes. Um, you know, of course, recently we've had the Club Q, um, shootings that have really um, helped us think about uh, the ongoing problems with transphobia and homophobia against the LGBTQIA plus community. And a similar thing, of course, happened in 2021 when there was more attention placed on Asian Americans because of these horrific shootings and murders, mass murders that occurred uh, in the Atlanta area. Uh, there were um, eight people killed uh, in uh, massage parlors or spas operated um, by Asian immigrants, um, and most of those killed um, were Asian women. And, you know, there was a notorious press conference uh, by the sheriff whose spokesperson said that uh, the shooter said the incident was not racially motivated um, and went on to say that the shooter had, a, or the suspected shooter at the time, just had a really bad day, right? And this really created um, outrage uh, amongst a lot of people, but particularly Asian Americans, who know from our own experience when something happens like this, that whatever is going on directly in the head of the gunman at that moment, and we're not going to take, you know, <laughs> his statements at face value, 
we know there are broader societal patterns. We know there are broader societal influences that shape, you know, interactions on any given day and that have continued to shape uh, patterns throughout history. And a lot of that was being ignored. Uh, and in fact, we found out through some uh, quick work by internet sleuths that the sheriff spokesperson had actually posted on uh, social media some racist uh, memes using words like China virus. Um, and of course, these were the types of statements that prominent public figures like President Trump at the time had used uh, that many of us saw uh, contributing to an upsurge in bias incidents um, and attacks against Asian Americans uh, during the uh, really the early months in particular uh, of, the, of the pandemic and then unfortunately have continued ever since then. And so, you know, in many ways, this becomes a form of national gaslighting for us to witness with our own eyes or experience ourselves these types of attacks. And then when people express concern that it is or very likely could be motivated by racism or sexism uh, or a history of colonialism, homophobia, transphobia, and so on, or police bias and misconduct, that, that no, we have to wait, you know, we have to um, let the shooter speak for himself, or we have to let authorities give their conclusion. But a lot of times these authorities aren't trained in ethnic studies. They're not trained in Asian American studies. They're not trained in women and gender and sexuality studies, right? And so this is why these fields have been really so important to correcting the broader biases that exist in society, in our institutions, in our economy, in our politics, in our popular culture. And this is just one example of many commentaries that were made by Asian American scholars, activists, uh, advocates, um, and more folks pointing out that, you know, it doesn't have to be race or gender. It doesn't have to be, you know, um, gun violence versus, um, you know, uh, structural discrimination. All of these things can be working in concert with each other or, you know, in uh, uh, the form that uh, many ethnic studies scholars and women gender studies scholars have talked about as intersectionality, right? These are intersecting forms um, of oppression in society, racism, sexism. And as this uh, headline says, while police said the suspect denied having racial motivations, experts and activists alike say it's nearly impossible to divorce race and I would also say gender and sexuality and you know uh, xenophobia uh, from the discourse given the historical fetishization of Asian women. So we wanna talk about what is the context in which these stereotypes of Asian women have developed both through actual interactions and of course, a lot of times through movie and TV and popular cultural stereotypes. But it's not just this incident in which we've seen this uh, um, marginalization or overlooking of these patterns of violence or discrimination or harassment of Asian American women. Even what I consider very top-notch journalism, the Serial Podcast, which really has won awards, it's been considered a breakthrough for the whole podcast phenomenon, and it played a direct role in drawing attention to the police misconduct of Adnan Sayed, who uh, is himself um, Asian American, right, uh, Muslim, Pakistani descent, um, and they did bring up some important points about uh, problems with police bias, um, you know, shoddy police practices, um, failure to really uh, address evidence uh, in a serious way. Uh, and they even addressed the problem of Islamophobia against uh, Muslim Asian Americans. But there was not a single episode of this series, this very, you know, deep, deeply investigative, award-winning journalistic series that asked the question, what are possible patterns of violence against Asian American women or Asian Americans more broadly that, it could, that could have shaped the attack on the victim? So they focused a lot on how Adnan was falsely suspected, but they didn't talk about how so many others who could have biases or violent tendencies towards an Asian American woman, whether they're an intimate partner or a random person they came across in the street, how any of those potential biases or patterns of oppression could have influenced the murder or could have at least been things that the police had seriously investigated, right? So again, even sometimes the best of our critical journalism um, and perspectives have not been fully educated to think about what kind of knowledge and expertise Asian American studies um, could add to the dialogue or investigation. And part of this is 
you know, there should be no reason why <laughs> these aren't at the forefront of our public consciousness, because Asia and Asian Americans have really been at the center of the major events, so many of the major events of the last hundred years, including, of course, the Vietnam War uh, and the migration and resettlement of Vietnamese and Southeast Asian refugees to this country. The My Lai Massacre, of course, commanded all kinds of headlines, even though it was originally covered up. This was the wanton slaughter of Vietnamese civilians, right? Uh, elders, children. And these were supposed to be American allies uh, in the fight against communism, right? But oftentimes people have never studied through all their K through 12 or even college history, the American war in the Philippines, which was marked by systematic torture um, and lynching. Um, we may know about the incarceration of Japanese Americans at this point. We may, of course, obviously even know about the atomic bombs being dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Many people don't realize that there was systematic targeting in this war of civilians through the firebombing of Tokyo. And as many as 75,000 or 100,000 civilians were killed um, through not collateral damage, but through systematic targeting. And this is not to excuse any of the atrocities that Japan committed, because there were very many against Americans and against, of course, even more so against other Asians and their own citizens in some cases. But... Um, there's no excuse for American history not to cover American involvement in wars and attacks on civilians. And what instead has happened is we've normalized the idea that, uh, you know, civilian deaths and targeting are simply a part of our history uh, that we don't even need to talk about it anymore. In fact, the No Gun Re Massacre involved the systematic slaughter of hundreds of Korean civilians during the early days of the Korean War in 1950, and this was deliberately and systematically covered up by the U.S. military for 50 years, not only when Bill Clinton was president, that this surfaced um, in the American media and the U.S. did acknowledge that it happened without doing a full, uh, a full-throated apology. And again, the reason why uh, wars, of course, are, are terrible and deadly on their own. But part of the reason why civilians have become a greater and greater part of the casualties of war is one, because of changes in war tactics and war weaponry, but also because that's been accompanied by a, a rallying of the public to the cause of wars through the use, deliberate use of dehumanization and racist stereotyping. Here's just simply an example. I mean, we could go through, you know, all the wars and all the images, but here's just one very graphic example of a cartoon uh, in a book by uh, an award-winning historian named John Dower called War Without Mercy, where you literally see, um, you know, Japanese people during World War II being portrayed as lice, you know, as vermin, and as people who need to be exterminated, and not just the soldiers, right? Uh, not just the combatants. It literally says a complete cure, before a complete cure may be affected, the origin of the plague, the breeding grounds around the Tokyo area must be completely annihilated. So you're literally talking about what happened, the firebombing uh, of civilian areas in Tokyo. Of course, you had these old wooden, you know, um, beautiful wooden homes and, and buildings that were so easily um, destroyed and caused such great civilian death and suffering. This is even before the atomic bombs were dropped. Uh, but of course, it wasn't just these, you know, um, obscure anonymous cartoonists. Um, it was some of our favorite, most beloved artists, such as Dr. Seuss, um, who in his um, zeal, to protect what he saw as American democracy against Japanese you know, uh, imperialism, also portrayed Japanese Americans, my own mother and family members and ancestors, here as essentially you know, secret terrorist cell combatants who were uh, um, ready to, to bomb the West Coast or, or, or sabotage, um, sabotage uh, civilian targets um, in LA and California, Oregon, Washington, you know, as it says here, waiting for the signal from home, as if we all had these secret loyalties, you know, to the emperor of Japan. So these were the justifications for both atrocities overseas, but
but also acts of discrimination and violence against Asians uh, in the US. Um, and it continued, of course, during the Vietnam War. And obviously we've all seen Vietnam War movies, you know, that have revived and proliferated uh, um, these stereotypes against um, Vietnamese, uh, Viet Cong um, soldiers and civilians as gooks, of course, the stereotype of Southeast Asian women as prostitutes uh, and sex, sex workers simply trying to please um, uh, American soldiers are, are, are just, you know, all over the place. But this was General William Westmoreland um, in an Academy Award winning documentary. The Oriental doesn't put the same high price on life as does a Westerner. Life is plentiful. Life is cheap in the Orient. And there's actually a story with the, the director where he says he just wanted to make sure, you know, even though he wanted this kind of, you know, uh, um, eye-catching quote to be in his film, he wanted to make sure that the, the he wasn't uh, taking it out of context. So he actually got the general to like repeat it two or three times, you know, and, and he just doubled and tripled down uh, on, on the concept. And these are the people leading the wars, you know, on behalf of our country um, and our military uh, against Asian people. Um, and when we talk about the use of the word gook to describe and dehumanize uh, Vietnamese um, enemies or even American allies in Vietnam, even John McCain continued to use the word gook while he was running for president of the United States in the year 2000. Um, and he was finally sort of questioned by reporters, you know, do you think this is appropriate, <laughs> Senator McCain? And we know, of course, Senator McCain was uh, very critical of Donald Trump for using ethnic slurs and, and, and racial stereotypes. And I think we should all commend him for that. Um, but in fact, he had to go through his own learning process, um, even to have some of his own, you know, supporters and allies tell him, you know, Senator McCain, that word gook is very offensive and degrading to some of your own supporters or many of your own supporters. Uh, and so he finally, you know, um, after originally being quite defensive and saying he would not stop using the term, um, he actually said, I will always hate the gooks, you know, as long as I live. And, you know, we will call them that. He finally backed down while running for president of the United States. Uh, probably not as shocking now in 2024, even uh, as, as it might have been to some in, in 2000. Um, so obviously, again, we have a long way to go, but at least it does show that people are capable of change. People are capable of learning um, and that should never be an excuse, you know, that, oh, they're just from an older generation, you know, and, and they'll never change. And so when we think about the experience of Asian immigrants and refugees, on the one hand, we do have a reputation and an image of America as a land of opportunity, as a nation of immigrants, as a place where the Statue of Liberty welcomes all, you know, you're tired, <laughs> you're hungry, you're huddled masses, you're needing to be free. But of course, that's not always been the case. And it's not always been the case because Asian immigrants and refugees have been forced and displaced as other immigrants and refugees of color have uh, by US or Western uh, militarism or imperialism or colonialism to begin with. So uh, when we talk about Chinese immigrants coming to the US to build railroads or look for gold. Well, that was in the context of Britain having really subdued China through two opium wars in the middle of the 19th century and imposing what were called the unequal treaties on China. Um, so there was economic, legal, um, and uh, military uh, inequity uh, that, was, that then forced some immigrants to seek you know, um, opportunities elsewhere, but also led them to come here as, uh, as people who were looked down upon, right? Treated as inferior. Um, Japan, Japanese immigration to this came, came after the US quote unquote, opened up Japanese society to US and the West through again, through military threats and gunboat diplomacy. India, of course, we know was, it was violently colonized um, by the British, um, but actually there were exiles that came here as immigrant workers in the early 20th century. Um, and actually started uh, the Gutter Party, which was fighting for independence for Britain. Well, the U.S. authorities actually colluded with the British authorities to repress and subdue and deport uh, many of these immigrants, some of whom were executed um, when they returned um, to India. The Philippines, as people may or may not know, was actually a formal colony of the U.S. The Philippines uh, had been colonized by Spain 
Filipinos launched a war for independence. The U.S. actually allied with the Filipinos uh, against Spanish colonialism. But when the Filipinos defeated Spain and declared independence, <laughs> the U.S. said not so fast uh, and waged a war against the Filipinos um, to deny the Philippines their independence. And it was only after Japan uh, took control of the Philippines that the U.S. and the Filipinos joined forces again to, you know, expel the Japanese colonizers. And then finally, the Philippines became independent. You know, still under a lot of U.S. influence. Um, Korea is an interesting case because Korea was colonized by Japan. And so Korean exiles actually came to the U.S. in the early 20th century seeking, like, like um, um, Indian migrants, to use the U.S. as a space of exile to fight for Korean independence. And the U.S. was more supportive of that movement because, um, you know, again, it was increasingly... Um, becoming um, at odds with Japan and was, did not have that same relationship that it had with Britain. Um, and of course, in the case of Vietnam, the very tragic story, we know Vietnam was colonized by the French, achieved independence through war, got the French to withdraw, and then of course, the U.S. became involved, set up a puppet government in South Vietnam, denied the attempts by the Vietnamese people to have elections, to unify the country, and of course, we ended up with what we call the Vietnam War and what they call uh, the American War. But we also know that that war did not stay in the within the borders of Vietnam, that the U.S. had a secret bombing um, and CIA-led war uh, against what they saw as a threat of communism in Laos, that the U.S. recruited uh, through the CIA allies amongst um, ethnic minorities like the Hmong population. Um, and so a lot of refugees from Laos came here uh, as casualties of this secret war, particularly after the U.S. withdrawal led to um, the communist government taking power and seeking to uh, retaliate against many of these U.S. allies, again, particularly um, the Hmong ethnic minority um, community. And so, again, a lot of these folks, refugees, came to the U.S. very impoverished, very, you know, with communities and families that had been destroyed by war. I mean, it got to the point where, you know, um, 10 and 12-year-old uh Boys were being recruited to fight in the war. I um, mean, it was a very difficult adjustment um, for them to come to the U.S., you know, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, at a time when they were being resettled in places that had been hit by the economic recession. And of course, that just bred all kinds of resentment. So these are the kind of contexts in which immigrants and refugees have had a really difficult time. Um, in some cases, they have achieve great educational or uh, economic uh, achievement. But then that has led to, um, you know, even new examples that, that we have to acknowledge that are ongoing, like, you know, uh, refugees from Afghanistan, right? You know, af after how, you know, um, terribly that war ended, many U.S. allies had difficulty even getting out of the country, right? And now have to start their lives all over again. But those who have had some success over the years, have often been branded with the model minority stereotype. And then this has been used to brand the entire Asian American community as really a um, kind of a tool or a cudgel to be wielded um, to argue against the broader concept of civil rights and anti-discrimination. So the argument is, you know, if you if you can distort and exaggerate the success stories of Asian Americans and then ignore um, um, all the ongoing structural problems with discrimination, then there becomes this um, delusional or fantasy narrative that says anybody can succeed in the U.S. and therefore Black and Native American and Latinx people um, don't need civil rights laws or don't need, you know, um, anti-discrimination measures. And of course, in many ways, that's what's inspired so many Asian Americans to create Asian American studies, to become activists. The idea that, you know, we're not here to have our own struggles be exploited in, in, in some um, disingenuous narrative to be used against other people. And of course, that can lead to all kinds of resentments and tensions bounce, bouncing back against our community. So, you know, I mentioned uh, I'm the president of the James and Grace Lee Boggs Foundation. This is a foundation set up um, to honor um, two uh, elders, ancestors, um, one, James Boggs, an African-American from the Jim Crow South in Alabama, and the second, um, a Chinese-American named Grace Lee Boggs, who um, was one of my mentors and uh, a co-author 
And as she writes, had I not been born female and Chinese American, I would not have realized from early on that fundamental changes were necessary in our society. I might have ended up teaching philosophy at a university. She did get a PhD, one of the first Chinese American or Asian American women to ever get a PhD in philosophy at that in 1940. Um, but she never taught in the university, never had a full-time job at a college or university. Um, and she says, I don't regret that. I might have wound up, wound up an observer rather than an active participant in the humanity stretching movements that had defined the last half of the 20th century. And even she lived into the early 20th, first century. And so she became a lifelong movement activist. She got to meet Malcolm X. She got to work with figures who are very prominent in my field now, of American studies, African-American studies, like CLR James. Um, James Boggs uh, became a very prominent figure as an auto worker uh, within the Black Power Movement in Detroit and even nationally and internationally. Um, and Grace has become really an icon for Asian American communities and particularly for Asian American and social justice activists from all backgrounds um, because of that dedication, because she did not limit herself to being a model minority. She did not focus just on her own ethnic identity, but she actually lived most of her adult life within the black community in Detroit and really became a symbol of how we can bring people from very different backgrounds together uh, to fight for a broader cause for humanity that we are very specific about eradicating anti-Blackness and the discrimination that African-Americans um, and other communities of color have faced, but there are also ways in which our struggles bring us together um, on a bigger level. And I just wanna end there by talking about some examples that hopefully you know, each one of these should be a unit you know, in a social studies class or, or in, in other classes at the K through 12 level, at the university level, at all levels of society. Um, that these patterns of discrimination are seen in really notorious laws that Congress passed, like the Chinese Exclusion Act, which just simply said straight out that we are banning Chinese people from coming to this country, except in some rare instances, you know, like a diplomat coming. Um, um, and uh, we're not going to allow any of these immigrants to become U.S. citizens, naturalized citizens, right? And that was reaffirmed by um, the Supreme Court on numerous uh, occasions. And it was important because that notion that Asian immigrants were ineligible to become citizens became the basis of laws at the state level and at the federal level, like the alien land laws, which simply said, if you're one of these basically Asian people who can't become a naturalized citizen, you can't buy land. <laughs> I mean, you're literally being systematically denied basic you know, things that uh, people in this country take for granted. You can buy land, you can farm the land that you buy. I mean, this is like almost Jeffersonian democracy at, at its core, completely denied uh, on the basis of race and immigration status. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, there were some test cases brought to the Supreme Court because at the lower level, uh, there were immigrants like uh, uh, Takao Ozawa or Bhagat Singh Dind um, who were able to um, establish, well, there's some ambiguity here because a lot of the um, um, discriminatory laws were against black people, right? If you're Asian, you know, well, you know, you're not black, but are you white? <laughs> and how does the law treat you? And the Supreme Court ruled very definitively that these Asian immigrants um, were basically quote unquote colored people uh, and they were not intended to enjoy any of the privileges that um, European immigrants um, and citizens uh, were afforded. Of course, during World War II, Japanese Americans didn't matter whether you are a citizen or a non-citizen. Um, the government ordered everybody uh, into um, concentration camps um, from the exclusion areas, primarily on the West Coast. Um, and of course, these things did not end with World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, as recently, you know, as this century with 9-11, with the so-called war on terror, we saw these systematic physical attacks, murders of South Asian, Arab and Muslim Americans, but we also saw deportations. We saw what was called indefinite detentions, racial profiling, the FBI sending informants to infiltrate mosques and, you know, collect information or even try to, you know, stir people to, to commit acts of terrorism. And so these are ongoing issues um, for sectors of the Asian American community that have often been overlooked uh, when, when the focus has been more, even when we talk about um, 
discrimination in Asian American studies on East Asian Americans. And for Southeast Asian Americans, as, as we've talked about, oftentimes they are in low income inner city communities, particularly when they were first resettled. As I mentioned, uh, Hmong American refugees had some of the most historically high rates of poverty um, and, and need for reliance on welfare um, in, in 20th century history. Um, and because they were in some of the same areas that were um, targeted by policing, you know, um, and the war on drugs and anti-crime measures, Southeast, these low-income Southeast Asian refugees were more likely to join gangs for their own self-defense, but they were also more likely to be targeted for police abuse, um, syst systemic discrimination, uh, and in some cases, police killings. But with this discrimination, we've also seen solidarity, right? So when George Floyd was killed, and of course there was outpouring of, of demonstrations everywhere, one of the most, I think, passionate and dramatic demonstrations uh, in Minneapolis was when the family of Fong Li, a Hmong American killed by the police and, and they never were able to get justice. The police said it was justified, uh, even though the community th said there was a lot of uh, um, evidence of, of misconduct and, and, and discrimination. They came out to say how much they identified with George Floyd's family. It was actually uh, Fong Li's mother who, who spoke. Um, and this was publicized um, and covered by the media in ways that, that symbolized a form of cross-racial solidarity. Um, obviously, because of you know, the war on terror, people have come together nationally, internationally, cross-racially. Um, and again, you know, the uh, redress campaign to get at least a formal apology for Japanese Americans. And in many ways, what was just a token symbolic payment has been used as an example of what can be accomplished when we push for reparations, when we recognize there are broader patterns of injustice that still have never been um, redressed. Um, in the Chinese Exclusion Act era, Frederick Douglass actually advocated for the rights of Chinese and Asian Americans. Instead, he believed the US in effect, should be a site of multiracial solidarity uh, and justice for all. And that was a very unpopular position to take during the era of, of Chinese exclusion. So there are all kinds of examples. You know, uh, many of the World War II concentration camps were built on Native American reservations, and there have been bases for um, indigenous peoples um, and, and Asian Americans to recognize both how we've been pitted against each other, but also how we can come together. Um, I'm going to close um, with just some questions then to consider once we can begin to incorporate these histories uh, into our lesson plans, into our classrooms, into our discussions within and beyond um, the school walls. We oftentimes say when uh, a bias incident occurs, you know, whether it's Club Q, whether it's the Atlanta shootings, um, I think even President Biden said this at the time, this is not America, right? And perhaps this is not what we want America to be or what we would like America to be. But the reality is, this is the America we must understand because it is part of our history. And if we don't include this at great appropriate levels all throughout our education, um, we're not gonna be able to reverse these patterns. And that's what's really important is reversing the patterns because the last thing I want us to consider is what would America be like today if racial, racial equity had been practiced throughout history? If it hadn't been for the Chinese Exclusion Act, if it hadn't been for these Supreme Court rulings denying Asian immigrants the right to become citizens, Asian Americans would be much part of a more diverse electorate, of a more empowered citizenry, of a more um, broader population that for many years had been uh, taught um, to respect and honor differences and, and, and understand diversity, right? And pluralism. Um, and so we're playing catch up now for decades and decades and decades, right? Of these indignities and these forms of discrimination and oppression, not just against Asian Americans, right? But of course, many, many, many people indigenous to this land and others who have came here through forced migration or, you know, um, migration conducted under less than total freedom. Um, and so I hope Asian American studies, you know, encourages us to learn the things that people never learned, you know, about their Asian American um, sisters, brothers, neighbors, 
things that Asian Americans themselves, like me, never learned through most of their education, um, but also that the fight for Asian Americans and the struggle, because it's never been something that's been gifted to, <laughs> to us or to any schools. It's always been through activism um, and advocacy that Asian American studies has, has slowly um, uh, expanded. Uh, that really the field itself becomes a window into rethinking all of our histories and finding new ways to connect and identify with each other. And I know that's part of the 10 point uh, <laughs> goals uh, that you have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. That was excellent. <clears throat> and I learned some things. I, I love, I mean, how short was that? And I definitely learned some things. Um, so I really appreciate you doing this. Uh, I do have just a few questions that I wanted to uh, run by you if you have the time. Um, I just, I really enjoy that your work has a, a focus lens on Asian American studies, but that is kind of more of a gateway to understanding broader issues of racial identity and culture in America. Um, our, our K through 12 system, our educational system is not particularly good at that. Um, and so I was wondering what kinds of adjustments, whether that's curricular, like you know the minutia or if it's a systemic in some way uh, or otherwise, um, what kinds of adjustments do you think would be helpful uh, for educators in facilitating this, this use of sort of culturally specific teaching that is part of a broader vision for an educational community building process. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's so important, right? Um, and like I'm saying, there's specific things about the Asian American experience that, that people should know, right? And, you know, again, um, for instance, my mother was put in a concentration camp during World War II. And I didn't know that. I didn't know how that shaped her life or my life or, you know, my community experience. Uh, I was just talking with my um, uh, my aunties and uncles uh, about how there was a study done of the children, you know, uh, who grew up after the war. Um, and the average person of my generation or people, you know, 10 years older than me, we talked about our parents talked to us on average 30 minutes in our entire childhood about the <laughs> World War II concentration camp experience. Right. Wow. Um, and that's because the government said, look. If you want to fit back into U.S. side, there are literally pamphlets of the government saying this. Don't teach your kids to speak Japanese. Don't live around other Japanese Americans. Don't restart these little Tokyos or Japanese American organizations, right? Mm -hmm. Assimilate as much as possible, and then we'll give you a chance. Uh, then we might give you a chance to fit back into U.S. society. And so yeah. it wasn't then, a voluntary Then the American choice. dream will be accessible to you. Yeah, it was not a voluntary choice, you know. Uh, and so when my mom first brought up the issue of camp, this is a almost ubiquitous experience uh, among my generation of Americans. I thought she went to summer camp. And <laughs> when, she, when she told me she went to camp for, you know, three or four years, I'm like, who goes to summer camp for three or four years? Right. I, I was about eight years old at the time, right? It, it's that mm -hmm. sort of, you know, end of your innocence as a child. And, and, and I was explaining, like, why did you, like didn't you want to come home and go to school again? And she said, well, we didn't have a choice. I mean, what do you mean? You know, like I can decide if I want to go to summer camp for a week or, you know, two mm -hmm. weeks, I'm not going to go for three or four years, you know? Yeah. Um, and she said, no, the government, the closest she ever came to explaining to me at that age, or even until probably I was in college or high school was, you know, no, we didn't have a choice. The government told us we had to go. And so, mm -hmm. you know, and of course there were people that resisted, but they were put in jail or there was right. a case. Fred Korematsu took all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court justices said, hey, this is perfectly fine with the Constitution as far as we're concerned. Um, and so, you know, there was very little space for resistance. But I think it's important to see the resistance where it did develop and how, you know, it never went away. And so when you have in the 60s and 70s movements to revisit this history through documentary films, through public testimonies, through legislation, you know, through uh, mass protests, that's when I think a lot of that, you know, uh, begins to surface. So again, my point there is um, a lot of us ourselves never learn this. And there's a similar experience. That's why when I talk to, say, you know, Southeast Asian refugees about uh, their experience or recent Chinese immigrants about their experience, 
they can oftentimes identify with, you know, what Japanese Americans went through, not because, you know, they're Japanese American, <laughs> but because they understand that a lot of their history is either very tragic and has never been dealt with or things that their parents found too painful um, to tell them. Um, so I think that's very important. Um, but obviously, everybody needs to learn this history. Um, and I think that's the really important thing, particularly to those of us who are educators, right? We need to demand that our training, that our curriculum, uh, that, that our education, our credentials, our degrees reflect, right? This very complex, you know, mm -hmm. um, history and experience and patterns of power uh, and oppression um, and, and protest and solidarity in this country's history. And it's not easy, obviously it's not easy um mm -hmm. we're asking a lot of ourselves we're asking a lot of our institutions um but that's what it takes to i think improve yeah. ourselves as individuals as educators as scholars as authors um and as society overall you know i mean hopefully yeah. if we put in the effort you know we we will achieve the society that, that we want um and it may yeah. not happen all in in in, in our lifetime um, but we can hopefully continue to plant those seeds for the future generations. Yeah, yeah. And and taking a critical eye to some of the things that we've been taught or some of the things that we believe to be true as well. It was interesting when you were talking about assimilation just now and, and explaining your, your own story, your own family's history, and learning little tidbits from, from your mom. I am embarrassed to say that I am a person who grew up thinking that uh, assimilation was part of uh, Asian culture and that, you know, the, I was taught that, well, the reason why you don't see um, Chinese people, Japanese people, you know, people from um, Southeast Asia, that you don't see them going through the same things that our culture is going through is because part of their culture is that they want to assimilate and they want to become part of the culture that they immigrated to. Um, leaving out the entire, you know, this entire uh, history and the fact that that is just not necessarily true at all. Um, that it was a, a, a purposeful campaign to try to um, to assimilate uh, Asian folks and to try to erase their cultural heritage and their cultural history as a way to sort of hide uh, its own complicity in, in some things. So that uh, I, I'm glad that you brought that up because, you know, that's that's a pretty heavy point to there's a pretty heavy aha moment. I think a lot of Americans probably have that, that same experience. Well, you know, the Asian American movement and Asian American studies was born in the late 1960s when, you know, the younger generation was resisting this sort of forced assimilation, this whitewashing and really reclaiming their histories, their ancestries, uh, not in a nostalgic way, but as part of movement building, right, to transform right. society. But it wasn't obviously just Asian Americans who were doing this. Right. It was in the context of the Black Power Movement, the American Indian Movement, the Chicano Movement, the Puerto Rican Movement, you know, Arab American movements. Um, because in many ways, all people of color um, and people from marginalized backgrounds had gone through that sort of forced assimilation right. process. I mean, exactly. you know, kids who spoke Spanish had their mouths washed out with soap by white teachers. You know, remember the famous um, historian Stanley Elkin said, you know, a Negro is is just a white man with black skin. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> right. And, and in right. many ways, the assimilationists, they were the liberals and the progressives of their times because the, the hardcore racists <laughs> were right. the ones that said they'll, they can't assimilate at all. I mean, and so, you know, even going back, you know, to the 19th century and the formation of these, you know, Native American boarding schools, right? One of the things exactly was, what I was about kill, to say, yeah. kill the Indian, save the man, right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah, right. in many ways, the atrocities we had to deal with in the 20th century were... Uh, were twofold, right? There were the outright genocidal uh, folks. And then there was the cultural genocide who said, well, we can keep them here um, as workers, <laughs> um, you know, right. as people who can serve society, maybe even some of them who go to college if we can whitewash them, right? right. Uh, and that's been a really different type of struggle that's continued, I think, into the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Very good points. Um, so currently, we're we're sort of living through a time 
um, when just discussing race <laughs> and America's problematic historical and current relationship with race, which is some of the things that we've just been discussing, it's it's highly politicized. Um, and it's it's politicized as, as often un-American or uh, unpatriotic. Um, and, and I think that that feeling, the overall feeling that's contributing to that is, is exacerbated a little bit by our colonial and neo-colonial past. And, um, you know, and by that, I mean that, that progress and prosperity um, are often kind of prioritized over human rights, um, histories, lived realities, and things like that of marginalized demographics. So, it, you know, they're put in opposition of each other. In order to have the society that we have now, we had to do the things that we did and are, are doing to uh, Black and Brown people all over the, the world and, and uh, domestically as well. So I guess my question is kind of a heavy one. It's a short one, but it's a heavy one. How, how do we, and by we, I mean people like you and I, but also uh, educators and, and just people on the bus, how, how do we speak truth in this environment? Well, it's really challenging. I mean, I spent the last two years, you know, at a job, my prior job in Texas. Um, and I saw these really passionate um, educators uh, being fired simply for being accused of teaching critical race theory, you know, um, simply because they they cared about equity. You know, they were cast with this label. And, and to me, it's not a bad label. I, I trained to read and study critical race theory. But when critical race theory is demonized and, and turned into this caricature, then somehow it's a crime uh, to be a, a, a you know critical race theorist, and so it, it was really you know uh, in the suburbs of Dallas and Fort Worth, you know in particular, I've seen this. There have been campaigns to ban books. Uh, some of them have already succeeded, um, and you know, uh, obviously in Florida you have this uh, stop woke or you know uh, anti woke law that that, that that the governor pushed and. His lawyers were just asked in court the other day by the judge to define what woke is. And basically they said woke, woke is when you believe that America has, you know, historic patterns of systemic injustice. <laughs> right. Well, um, you know, that was <laughs> built into the Constitution. I mean, right. slavery is built in the Constitution, the three-fifths right. compromise. I mean, the Dred Scott decision, all those laws that I, this isn't me uh, opinionating uh, about the nature of this law. I mean, literally, you have Supreme Court justices saying the races are not meant to be, you know, integrated or equal mm -hmm. or, or treated the same way. Um, and so, you know, the idea that you cannot teach about systemic injustice means you cannot teach American history, right? And the only way you can convince people that you're still getting education is to um, is to miseducate them, right? To believe that the miseducation is proper. So obviously, to me as an educator, I don't care what political party you belong to. You know, obviously, you know there are people that want to use these issues for for campaign purposes. But the reality is, education transcends, you know, partisanship. And you know, you might use your education for all types of political or economic or, or cultural purposes, and that's part of being in America. But the idea that you know we're not going to teach history at all, or we're going to fire people or censor people um, for trying to teach history, that that that's a really hard one to take. And you know, it's not something that's happening in a vacuum, though, right? At the same time, uh, I grew up in California. And California has expanded K through 12 at the college level requirements for teaching about diversity and equity and race and ethnicity, you know, uh, in ways that um, I, I never experienced growing up in a very diverse part of, you know, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I had the most Eurocentric education anyone could possibly imagine, even though all my classmates were very diverse. And, you know, again, I was in so-called, so you know, blue blue um california at the time um and so you know i think this is this is going to continue uh everywhere but it's going to look different everywhere um and unfortunately you know we are a very divided country now we're divided as a nation we're divided you know by race ethnicity by class by gender sexuality um and unfortunately though that's not new unfortunately that's not new but right on the other hand we do have a legacy of struggles for democracy and equity in this country and around the world, right? 
that we can learn from, that we can build on. You know, Grace Lee Boggs, as I mentioned, she died at the age of 100 in 2015. She's no longer with us, but she's left us a legacy of writings, of practice, of community building, you know, of movement building. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot others like her, you know, Ella Baker, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, you know, there are just so many folks um, in the world of education and beyond uh, that can really inspire us um, to be better than the, what we've been in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's put that on a t-shirt somewhere. Uh, uh, the, your quote, let's see, education transcends partisanship. I love that. So I'm just going to end here with one last little question, um, because at SWIFT, we, we've worked really hard to develop what we call a 10-point paradigm, and it's just a framework uh, for how our center um, can, can bring equity to the forefront, equity and justice, um, to every layer of the work that we're doing. So um, I've shared that with you previously. Was there any point in that paradigm that particularly resonated with you? Yeah, no, it's it's a really wonderful uh, ten point paradigm. Obviously, we've already talked about telling the whole story. I think you know, uh, in my presentation, the idea of a decolonized perspective uh, is is really crucial. Uh, and so, I want to focus on the notion of a collective identity, um, and I think that goes hand in hand with having a restorative educational ecosystem, because mm -hmm. education for me is not an individual pursuit. Obviously, it involves individual hard work, achievement, sure. studying. You know, um, sure. But ultimately, the reason why we have public education uh, is because it's good for all of us in society. You know, right. the education of other people's children benefits my children, benefits me, it benefits all of us, right? And so that collective identity is important. But it's also bringing folks together, not to, you know, again, to create an us versus them mentality, which is so mm -hmm. rooted, right? In xenophobia, in nationalism, I just saw by 397 to zero, Putin and Russia passed a law banning not just, you know, gay marriage or marriage equality, but like any expression of homosexuality in public. Wow. I mean, so, you know, that type of collective identity is, you know, again, oftentimes used for authoritarian, you know, and, 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 and. Uh, fascist or, or discriminatory purposes, obviously at its worst extremes. We've seen that with genocide of Native Americans, with, you know, Hitler and, and the Nazi fascism. Um, but I think this is where I think the restorative educational ecosystem is so important because our goal is not to talk about oppression and inequity to pit people against each other, but to right. talk about how we can all benefit Right. right. Why do people who should want to live in a society where you're not only uh, constantly being pitted against each other, oppressing each other, but you always constantly then live in fear of people, you know, right. um, um, coming at you because of how they perceive you as an oppressor, you know, um, or as, you know, uh, someone who's, uh, you know, a threat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I this is just part of being human. We should be striving to expand our humanity. This is what James and Grace Lee Boggs taught us. Um, and that's oftentimes been our very radical idea, right? Equality and equity and, and integration have been radical ideas in the past. Um, but that's only because, you know, the systems that we as humans create, they're not natural <laughs> systems. They're not human nature. The systems that people in power at different moments um, have have implemented, have pitted us against us, have taught us that some people are better than others, that differences are immutable, right? Um, and the reality is now, the challenges we are facing as humanity, or as just living things on this planet in the age of mass extinction and catastrophic climate change really require us to come together. I mean, one of the biggest tragedies of the COVID pandemic Obviously, the most obvious one is how you know deadly this disease has been and how much suffering it's caused. But I think related to that, and part of the reason why so many people have died is this pandemic has driven us apart rather than bring right. us more together. Obviously, a lot of people have come together, but on a societal right. level, we've been driven apart. And so instead of putting our heads and hearts together to mm -hmm. all help each other, 
-hmm. It's like people are fighting over whether, you know, <laughs> you know, a vaccine that can that can save that can save lives, um, you know, should be banned or, you know, uh, uh, people should be, um, um, I mean, there's people that literally, literally want to, you know, um, punish or jail or, or even violently attack, uh, you know, Dr. Fauci for, for, for talking about how important vaccines are. Um, and that's a big tragedy because that means that doesn't just affect what happens now with the, the pandemic. It affects all our needs for education and healthcare, you know, and addressing mm -hmm. climate change and the environment going forward. Um, right. And so, you know, the challenges are immense, um, but that's also part of being human. That's also part of being alive. You know, um, mm -hmm. you know, the challenges end um, um, sadly when we're no longer alive or we no longer have any democratic voice, you know, uh, and we're sort of spiritually dead. Well, and the, the challenges are significant enough that to me, they require sort of a collective approach. They require sort of all hands on deck uh solutions to to figuring out how we're gonna to solve some of this stuff and it's, it's we're never going to get to those solutions if we're leaving over half of the population out of the conversation um you know we're just too connected globally i think to be able to just be leaving voices out the way that we have in the past i mean obviously we shouldn't have in the first place but you know i mean we're talking about global pandemics we need all hands on deck. And, and I, I feel like the fallout from, from COVID is really something that we're going to be wrestling with for the next, at least the next decade or more. Um, all the, um, the inequity in terms of uh, how the solutions were, were come upon, who was getting vaccines, who wasn't getting vaccines and why. Um, the use of, like we talked about before, fear as a way to divide us, um, uh, miseducating people about what was it actually was and how it actually worked in order to stoke fears and create more partisanship and so on and so on. So, um, but that's for another time. <laughs> we could go all the way pretty deep into that. Um, I just want to say, uh, Dr. Kurshige, that I really appreciate your time. Um, Swift really appreciates your time. Um, and, um, we hope to, uh, be able to work with you sometime in the future again, if possible, because we're, we're all fans of your work and, um, and just thank you again. Well, thank you. And I just want to say in closing, I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you to Swift, but I also just want to thank all the teachers and educators that are out there in the audience, whether you're watching this or not. Um, I'm the parent of a 12th grader now applying for college. I'm also the parent of a second grader uh, who has an IEP um, and has Down syndrome and, and other disabilities. Um, and I know how much effort uh, and dedication it takes um, and how important that is for us you know, uh, and for our children. And I know it's oftentimes done not because the wages are high, <laughs> not because the resources right. are provided, and particularly those that care about Asian American studies and ethnic studies. The textbooks and the assigned curriculum have been very slow to incorporate these materials you know, for teachers. And so throughout my career, I've gone out of my way to try to not just write books for other academics, but to create those teacher's guides, curriculum guides, to help create documentary films and study guides to go along with, with books. Uh, folks now, I'm working with some authors writing a, a children's book about Grace Lee Boggs. Um, and, uh, you know, if we, we did at, at my former um, institute, we created a multicultural education institute with the city of uh, Fort Worth Public Schools. Um, and so, you know, we are happy I think a lot of us who come from, you know, um, the history profession and, and from the universities to collaborate, you know, we welcome, you know, those partnerships um, because we know, you know, the, the, your job is difficult and the better we, the easier we make your job, the better the students come to us at the university right. level. But more so than that, we just know that that dedication and that passion and that commitment is just so important for our society overall and to really to make the world a better place. So thank you to all the teachers and educators, social workers, speech therapists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, paraprofessionals, yeah. <laughs> assistant principals, and and because uh, I meet with all of you when I have my IEP meetings and, and I know how important your work is. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Thank you for watching this Equity Forward Forum for Educators. Please follow Swift Education Center on social media and visit swiftschools.org for more information on who we are and what we do. Until next time, lead with love and center the kiddos.